Hi there. You are listening to the Hellenistic Age podcast, episode 48, Persian and Iranian Survival in a Hellenistic World. After two centuries of ruling over much of Eurasia, the Achaemenid Persian Empire, founded by Cyrus the Great in the mid-6th century, would come to an end when the last great king, Darius III, was unceremoniously murdered in the remote land of Bactria by a rogue subordinate in 330 BC. The Achaemenid dynasty collapsed in the wake of invasion by the Macedonian king, Alexander the Great, and the subsequent infighting of Alexander's successors resulted in the creation of several kingdoms atop of the empire's corpse. The Greco-Macedonians became the new elites in a new Hellenistic world for the next three centuries, replacing the previous Persian ruling bodies and noble families in areas like Western and Central Asia. However, the triumph of the Greeks did not spell the end of Persian and Iranian civilization, as both commoners and elites alike managed to get a foothold in the new geopolitical dynamic, whether out of a desire for self-preservation and continuation of their daily lives, or by taking advantage of the chaos, by setting out to found new dynasties of their own. Peoples such as the Mithridatids of Pontus, the Ariarathids of Cappadocia, Atropatids of Media, and the last Achaemenid princess, Amastris, all managed to navigate through the turbulent period of the early Hellenistic Age to varying degrees of success. In this episode, we'll be approaching the Macedonian conquest and early Hellenistic period from the Persian and Iranian perspective, follow the careers of several important dynasties and kingdom founders, and end by looking at the ways Iranian culture adapted and propagated in a new Hellenistic world. It would be appropriate to begin this episode with a brief discussion on what I exactly mean when I speak of Persian and Iranian. Iranian is a term that is broad in scope, and used as either an ethnic, linguistic, or cultural designation that, when referring to the ancient world, can include groups as diverse as nomadic Scythians and imperial Persians. It also can be used to refer to the peoples of the modern nation of Iran, who are seen as the political and cultural heirs of ancient Iran. The traditional homeland of Iranians was spread across much of Western and Central Asia, in the region known as the Iranian Plateau. The Zagros Mountains marks its western borders and ends just shy of the Indus River in the east. This includes the historical regions of Persia, Bactria, Media, Parthia, and many others who had, and continue to have, predominantly Iranian-speaking populations, especially in modern Iran. The individual differences between the various Iranian peoples who lived in these lands was, and are, considerable. But for the sake of narrative, convenience, and flow, I have placed them in a large grouping generally labeled Iranian. To try and make it simple, in the context of this episode, Iranians and Persians are going to be synonymous terms. The focus of the episode is mainly on these elites, since we have much better evidence for their movements and behaviors, and they are to be contrasted against the new political elite of Greco-Macedonians. Hopefully I've cleared this up a bit, and you'll excuse me if I generalize a bit for a rather complicated subject. For the Persians, it would be quite shocking to learn that the architects of their downfall would be of the Ioana Takabara, a name given by the Persians to the Macedonians which meant the Greeks who wear shields on their heads. This refers to the broad-rimmed Kausia hat frequently depicted on images of Macedonians both before and after the time of Alexander. They were a far-flung and inconsequential peoples who were briefly subjugated by Darius I in the early 5th century, but beyond that, their role in Achaemenid history was negligible. The subjugation of Greece by King Philip II must have caused considerable concern in the court of the great king, who had eyes and ears keeping track of events abroad, and the initial reports of Alexander's plans to cross into Asia prompted a bit of a crisis. Despite his best efforts in fielding some of the largest armies in the world, Darius III was no match for the military might and tactical brilliance of Alexander, and was personally sent fleeing at both Issus and Galgamela, before being murdered in Bactria in 330 by one of his satraps. Conquest by a foreign barbarian would no doubt inspire fear among the house of Darius. The elimination of an entire ruling family is not uncommon in the annals of history, especially by foreign conquerors. Despite Darius's death, it appears that Alexander had no desire to inflict any harm on the surviving royal women and children he captured during the Battle of Issus in 333, dramatically portrayed by Alexander's warm reception of Darius's mother, Sissy Gambus, following her supplication. Even Darius's murder was something that all sources report as a setback to Alexander's plans of clemency. Admittedly, the political realities of needing legitimacy to claim the Persian throne were probably as important as Alexander's chivalrous tendencies, 
killing the royal wives, queen mother, and children of the great king, all descendants of Cyrus, was not likely going to engender any feelings of loyalty from the upper Persian nobility. This aim for legitimacy likely compelled him to marry both Statyra and Parisatis, both Achaemenid princesses, and pass off another of Darius' daughters to his close companion, Hephaestion, at the mass wedding of Susa. In some respects, it might be plausible to list Alexander as the last Achaemenid, according to the tradition of Darius and his forebears. He married Persian princesses, made only minor adjustments to the administration, was reasonably tolerable and inclusive towards his Persian and Iranian subjects, and had been open to adopting court customs befitting a Shahansha, a great king. His behaviors didn't always win praise, mind you, as his destruction of Persepolis and the alleged persecution of Zoroastrian priests earned him the moniker of Iskandar Guzestag, Alexander the Accursed. Never mind the abuses inflicted upon the native populations under his command, intentional or otherwise. These policies of cultural inclusion did not please Alexander's Greco-Macedonian subordinates, who openly criticized their king, whether it was regarding the practice of proskinesis or the enrollment of Persian troops trained in the Macedonian art of war, known as the Epigonoi. Not all were of this opinion, mind you, as Alexander's bodyguard and satrap Pucestus was a Persophile, dressing up in Persian garb, and being the only Macedonian among them to actually learn the Persian language, much to the chagrin of his fellow officers. Much of the empire's administration remained under Persian and Iranian satraps as well, especially in the so-called upper satrapies. This is a sensible move, considering that the upper satrapies would include most of the Iranian plateau, and thus indigenous Iranians made up the vast majority of the population. But the death of Alexander in 323 would put the kibosh on many plans and policies that were more tolerant of Iranian involvement within the machinery of governance, as his successors would tear the empire apart. Most of the Macedonian commanders married by Alexander at Susa abandoned their Iranian wives shortly thereafter, the notable exception being future King Seleucus and his wife Apame. Both the Iranian nobility and commoners found themselves caught between the violent power struggles, being forced to choose between one foreign conqueror and another, such as the Babylonian War between the forces of Seleucus and the Antigonids around 310 BC. The attitudes of these generals towards the indigenous communities varied, with some like Seleucus reaching a degree of mutual understanding with these peoples, given that they comprised a large portion of their military forces, while others expressed indifference or neglect. But we are not here to only discuss the policies and practices of the Greeks and Macedonians, as I've already covered many, many times over by this point. And so next, we will turn to the responses of the Persians and Iranians, as many not only sought to survive the warfare of Alexander's successors, but also saw opportunities to throw off the Macedonian yoke, and establish new kingdoms in their own. 200 years after the death of Alexander III of Macedon, Persia would re-emerge as one of the world's great powers, as the Parthians and Sassanids built an empire not even Rome itself could conquer. If you're interested in learning more about the Hellenistic, Parthian, and Sassanid eras of Persian history, then check out the King of Kings podcast, which covers a thousand years from the death of Alexander to the Islamic conquests. And with all that said, let's return to the Hellenistic Age podcast. Although we have a number of named Iranians that were active during the wars of the Diadochoi, we have very little information actually about them. Never mind the lack of sources for the period in general, ancient historians were primarily interested in the players of the time, especially those of their own culture. And so, what information we get tends to be secondary at best. In addition, foundation stories are fraught with mythologizing and storytelling that must be considered, since these are effectively kingdom founders. Following Alexander's death in 323, the upper satrapies had effectively become independent, with some areas like Bactria undergoing a revolt which demanded considerable attention from the likes of Python, and the remaining Macedonian officials were either gradually removed by attrition in the wars of the successors or by native rebellions. These territories were mostly brought back into the Macedonian fold following the eastern campaign of Seleucus I from 307 to 304, but many of them continued to function as independent or semi-autonomous, headed by military strongmen of Iranian origin. One of these major players was a man named Atropates, Atorpat in Old Persian, meaning protected by the fire. Prior to the invasion of Alexander, he had been the satrap of Media, roughly analogous to modern Azerbaijan, which was the former homeland of the Medes, 
the imperial predecessors and distant relations of the Persians. Following the defeat of Darius at the Battle of Galgamela in 331, he had gone over to Alexander's side and remained a loyal official, eventually being reinstated as the Median Satrap by 327 BC. Atropates even managed to capture and deliver several rebels on the king's behalf. His trustworthiness was such that his daughter was given in marriage to the later standing regent Perdiccas. Despite his past services and connections, his position as satrap was undermined at the partition of Babylon, as media was divided into greater and lesser portions, with Atropates being given the latter, in favor of a Macedonian official. We lose track of Atropates' career after this, but the geographer Strabo indicates that, Probably shortly after the demise of the powerful commander of Python in 316, he declared independence and proclaimed himself King of Media, which he would rename Atropatakana, but to the Greeks and later Romans, it would be known as Media Atropatine. The successors of Atropates managed to retain a degree of independence down to the 3rd century AD, before finally being swallowed up by either the Parthian or the Sassanid Empire. A minor but still relevant figure lay to the west of Media in mountainous Armenia, the satrap named Orontes. The history of Armenia in the Achaemenid and Hellenistic period is rather complicated, and so I don't want to completely cover it here. However, it will become far more relevant when the Artaxia dynasty takes power, and especially during the reign of its most famous king, Tigranes II, so I promise we will discuss it in much greater detail later. Orontes was the latest in an Iranian noble family that traced its origins back to Hydarnes, one of the seven Persians that assisted Darius in taking the Persian throne. It appears that he was rewarded with the office of satrap of Armenia, which became a hereditary position carried by the family. The relationship between the Orontids, known in later Armenian chronicles as the Yervantids, and the Achaemenids was complicated some instances suggesting ties of marriage, while others having the Orontids outright declare independence and kingship. By the time of Alexander's invasion, Orontes was serving with Darius as a head of a contingent of Armenia's famed cavalrymen at the Battle of Galgamela, but we have limited information as to what happened next. It's very likely that Armenia was never fully conquered by Alexander, but Orontes seems to have held his position as satrap, and actually developed a friendly relationship with the Macedonian Persephile Pucestus. This whole affair is pretty confusing, as some of my books believe that Orontes' career was split over two people of the same name, presumably father and son, while others insist that it was the same Orontes. But at some point, Orontes was declared king of Armenia, founding a line that would continue until the very end of the 3rd century, before the next important Armenian dynasty, the Artaxids, would take control of the kingdom. The success of both Atropates and Orontes in these regions is understandable, given its proximity to the Persian heartland and being populated largely by Iranian speakers. However, the place that would host the greatest establishment of Persian dynasties in this time would be the mountainous lands of Asia Minor and the Black Sea. During his conquests, Alexander was largely concerned with the cities of the southern coastal region, such as Halicarnassus, but he had largely bypassed the more northern territories. Pontus, Paphlagonia, and Cappadocia were all subservient to Alexander on paper. However, Cappadocia had been in rebellion by the time of his death. Iranians were not indigenous to these regions, but had been migrating and settling there for centuries following the armies of Cyrus the Great in the 540s, adding to its already diverse collections of peoples, including native Anatolians and Ionian Greeks. The dominance of the Persian Empire had led to a degree of Iranization in the material culture and religion of these regions, especially in Cappadocia and Pontus. A bit of geographical clarification. In the Persian period, all of northern Anatolia and the southern Black Sea coast was generally classified as the satrapy of Cappadocia, known as Katpatuka, but its individual regions would become, from left to right, Bithynia, Paphlagonia, Pontus, and finally Cappadocia, which bordered neighboring Armenia to the east and Syria to the south. This region was the perfect opportunity for ambitious city-states and dynasts looking to declare independence. Its mountainous terrain was a natural barrier to potential invaders while also possessing agriculturally rich areas along the coast. It was extremely wealthy given its position as part of the trade routes between Europe and Asia, both on land and sea, and its city-states could bargain with the Hellenistic powers because of its geographical importance. During the Hellenistic period, it would become a bit of a political hodgepodge and a major headache for Seleucid kings, 
as we will see in this and future episodes. During the time of Alexander's invasion, one notable holdout was a man named Ariarathes, the satrap of northern Cappadocia. Ariarathes was of a noble Iranian family that had long controlled the region, and though he was likely in his 70s during Alexander's Asian campaign, his territory had been the focal point of resistance, having never been in the path of the Macedonian king. By 323, Alexander was dead, and Ariarathes was still in revolt and had taken to calling himself king. The problem of Cappadocia was to be handled by an expendable subordinate, in this case, Eumenes of Cardia, who was given control over an unconquered and unsubjugated Cappadocia and Paphlagonia. The now 82-year-old Ariarathes was finally faced with a Macedonian army, headed by Eumenes and the standing regent Perdiccas in 322-321, and though he put up significant resistance, he was defeated and slain, either in the field of battle or after being crucified with much of his family on Perdiccas's orders. Ariarathes' death and the subsequent Macedonian rule did not spell the end of the dynasty, since one of his nephews, Ariamenes, had escaped the massacre and fled towards neighboring Armenia. The southern part of Cappadocia would eventually become an enclave of the Ariarathids, for Ariarathes II would return in the 280s and kill the Antipatrid governor Amintas with the help of the Armenian king Erodates. This whole affair is very fragmentary and hard to reconcile within the sources, but our first confirmable king would be Ariarathes III in the 250s, who would declare his independence from the Seleucid Empire and establish a direct line of rulers that would persist until the early 1st century BC, before being extinguished by Mithridates VI of Pontus. Speaking of which, let's turn to the Mithridates, or is the Mithridates? Scholars constantly fluctuate between Mithra and Mithri, so it's a matter of choice and consistency, but I'm going to stick with Mithridates from this point on since it rolls off my tongue better. The name in either variation is a Hellenized version of the Old Persian Mithridatha, meaning sent by Mithra, the Iranian god of light and order. The Mithridated family is traditionally thought to have been a ruling body over the city of Chios in Western Asia Minor, but it is likely that they were actually influential in the wider region of Mycia as a whole, not just in the city itself. At the time of the Macedonian invasion, there are two Mithridateds of note. There is the elder Mithridates, who was head of the family, and his nephew Mithridates Catistes. While a young man, Mithridates had sided with Eumenes of Cardia, and proved himself a talented warrior against the forces of Antigonus Monophthalmos at the Battle of Gabiene in 315 BC. Despite losing the battle and the death of his benefactor, Mithridates was received into the Antigonid camp, eventually becoming close friends with Antigonus' son, the future Demetrius Polyarchides, who was close in age. For the next year or so, things seemed to be going quite well for Mithridates. But according to legend, perhaps while at the Siege of Tyre in 314, Antigonus is said to have dreamed of a rich field of gold, but before he could harvest the gold, it was snatched up by Mithridates, who fled to the coast of the Black Sea. The dream continued to concern Antigonus, and so he revealed to his son that he had plans to kill the young Iranian nobleman to prevent any sort of treason. This was a mistake, for although Demetrius was sworn to silence, he nevertheless told his friend by drawing the words, Fly, Mithridates, in the sand, and in the following night, Mithridates quickly packed up and fled for northern Cappadocia, settling into the fortress of Chimiata with a band of followers. The story of Mithridates' flight is clearly embellished with some degree of mythology and storytelling, and trying to discern the truth of such a matter is basically impossible. Perhaps there was something in the behavior of Mithridates that actually suggested a change of allegiance, and Mithridates' uncle would later be executed by Antigonus in 302 on similar grounds. The rest of Mithridates' career is mysterious, and we don't have the evidence to firmly discern his role in the events surrounding the later part of the Wars of the Diodohoi. We are told that Mithridates inherited the lands of his uncle in 302 following his death, and his personal territories had grown substantial enough to eventually declare himself a king, perhaps during the initial chaos of Asia Minor following the deaths of the kings Seleucus and Lysimachus in 281-280 BC. Now known as Mithridates I Catistes, meaning Mithridates the Founder, he would found his capital city of Amasea in the region that they now call Pontus, where his descendants would rule a mildly powerful kingdom for centuries. This state of affairs would continue until the greatest of its kings, Mithridates VI Eupator, would take the throne and become the champion of Greeks and Asians alike, 
against the great power of the Roman Republic. That, however, is a story for another episode. The last of our important Iranian dynasts, and one of the most fascinating figures that I did not cover in my episodes on the wars of the Diodohoi, nor on Hellenistic women, would be known as Amastris or Amastrin. Born in roughly 340 BC, Amastris was an Achaemenid princess, the daughter of Darius' his brother, Oxyathres, who spent much of her childhood being raised in the royal household alongside her cousins, Satyra and Parisatis, and was captured along with her extended family following the Battle of Issus. Her importance was such that she was given as a bride to Craterus, one of the most trusted commanders of Alexander, and received a Greek education with the rest of her family, which likely served her well in her later years. The death of Alexander precipitated a culling of the remaining members of the Achaemenid house, as both Satyra and Parisatis were murdered on the orders of Roxanne, Alexander's principal wife, who saw them as a threat to her unborn son. This meant that Amastris was now the last surviving Achaemenid princess and member of the royal household, left alone to face the brunt of the wars of the Diodohoi, with little prospects of coming out alive. Her marriage to Craterus unraveled rather quickly, as the general would attempt to marry into the house of Antipater in Macedon, and died shortly thereafter in battle against the Eumenes of Cardia in 321. However, it seems that this was a mutual agreement, as Amastris herself had been arranging some sort of political marriage with a figure named Dionysius, a strongman in the city of Heraclea, between the regions of Bithynia and Paphlagonia. We have access to a surprising amount of information about this city thanks to a hometown historian named Memnon of Heraclea, who composed a history of Heraclea that was preserved via a Byzantine summary, and so we have him to thank for the details regarding Amastris' later life. This Dionysius had set himself up as the tyrant of the city, in the political turbulence following the Macedonian invasion, and although he was quite ugly and had a reputation for gluttony that would make Magus of Kyrene blush, he was an effective ruler and astute diplomat, maintaining his independence by playing off several important figures in the Macedonian Empire. If he was looking to extend his political clout, then Amastris would be an excellent choice, as her pedigree and knowledge of the political elite of the former Persian Empire was aided by her education in Greek and experiences with the Macedonian nobility, which meant she could act as a medium between both spheres. As for her interests, Amastris could secure comfort similar to her life in the Persian palace, but most of all, she could secure her own safety in the messy and violent politics at the time. By all accounts, the marriage was a happy one, as she would bear three children with Dionysius, two boys named Clearchus and Oxyathres, and a daughter also named Amastris, an interesting blend of Greek and Persian names. Dionysius' position had strengthened because of the marriage, and Heraclea flourished under his rule, enough to allow him to claim the title of king in 306 BC in the same mold as the Diadohoi. It's also very likely that Amastris' role as an advisor was imperative to his success, for when his gluttonous habits finally caught up to him, he bequeathed his rule of the city to her, shortly before his death in 305. Though the city continued to prosper underneath her watch, the events of the wider Hellenistic world, namely the Fourth War of the Diodohoi, had compelled Amastris to move away from her husband's alliance with Antigonus I, Monophthalmos, and seek marriage to King Lysimachus I, the great power of the Bosphorus in Thrace in 302 BC. This turned out to be a good bet, since Antigonus would be killed in the following year at Ipsus. Lysimachus likely benefited from Amastris' Persian connections in both Asia Minor and beyond, since those were both under considerable control by his rival Seleucus. For two years, Amastris lived with Lysimachus in the city of Sardis, and her then mature sons Clearchus and Oxyathres were able to retain their position in Heraclea under Lysimachus' blessing, though as tyrants rather than kings. According to tradition, the marriage between Lysimachus and Amastris ended thanks to the interference of Arsinoe, daughter of Ptolemy I and later sister-wife of Ptolemy II Philadelphus, who would entrance Lysimachus with both her beauty and her political importance. The exact circumstances of this whole affair have been heavily debated. The traditional narrative of Arsinoe being a political mastermind has been challenged, as some, like Elizabeth Carney, argue that Amastris left the marriage of her own accord, unwilling to be relegated to a secondary role in the polygamous household. Bronco F. von Oppen de Ritter posits in his article on Amastris, which has been of enormous help to me, that there was no divorce, 
but rather that she returned back to the city of Heraclea as part of a mutual arrangement, wherein she would extend Lysimachus's power by acting as his representative in a state of semi-autonomy. Whatever the case may be, Amastris returned to Heraclea, and quickly departed towards the region of Paphlagonia, where, in an act of Sinoikism, she united four settlements into one, founding the city of Amastris, modern Amsara. In a rather unprecedented act, she began to mint her own coinage in her own name, perhaps the first woman in the ancient world ever to do so, which bore the title Basilices Amastrios, the royal lady Amastris in Greek, effectively making a statement that she was an independent queen. Amastris was something of a pioneer in this regard, blending the imagery of both Greco-Macedonian and Persian traditions to bolster her position, leading some to call her the first Hellenistic queen. For the next 10 to 15 years, Amastris ruled, well, Amastris, but we have very limited information on what she exactly did. Her sons in Heraclea, on the other hand, were earning a reputation for cruelty and greed during their mastery of the city, and for whatever reason, they turned against their own mother too, and had her killed while on a ship in the Black Sea during the year 285 to 284. This betrayal would not last for long, since Lysimachus swept in and executed the matricides within the year, allegedly out of a lingering affection for his one-time queen, but also to destroy any potentially rogue tyrants. Either way, though Queen Amastris was now dead, her city would continue to thrive for centuries afterwards, a testament to the legacy of the first Hellenistic queen and the last of the Achaemenid dynasty. With a general idea of the important places and figures, let's talk more about the ways in which these kings and kingdoms continued to perpetuate Iranian traditions, and how they adapted to the changing circumstances of the political environment. As a testament to its cultural memory, virtually all of the Iranian dynasties claim some sort of connection to the Achaemenid house. The Mithridates were said to have been descended from one of the seven Persian nobles that helped Darius I assassinate the liar king Gaumata, or from the founder of the house, Achaemenes himself. Ariarathes and his kin linked their ancestry to Cyrus the Great and one of the seven, while Arontes' family was married into the royal house during the reign of Artaxerxes II in the mid-4th century BC and were the descendants of the nobleman Hydarnes. On the surface, creating a fictitious genealogy for figures of royalty is something not to be unexpected, as was done by the Arpad kings of Hungary, who offered a tenuous connection to Attila the Hun, or the claims of Ptolemy I being a bastard son of Philip II of Macedon. However, the nature of Achaemenid rule was very personal, and connection to the upper nobility through marriage was not out of the realm of possibility, so such claims can't automatically be thrown away. It's also very possible that there was a competitive edge between the rival dynasts as to whose lineage predated the others, since the kingdoms of Pontus and Cappadocia bordered right next to one another. Some monarchs assumed titles that were right in line with the Achaemenids as well. Pharnakes II of Pontus, ruling nearly 250 years after Mithridates I, held the title King of Kings, an explicitly Persian and Near Eastern epithet. Others held names that also belonged to Achaemenid rulers. Mithridates VI named his son Cyrus, Darius, and Xerxes, and Mithridates himself is to have undergone a traditional Persian education. Religious practices reveal elements of Iranization and continuity as well. The Mithridated kings would sacrifice to Zeus Stratios in an elaborate ritual upon a mountaintop that was near identical to the customs of the Achaemenid monarchs. The Iranian goddess of fertility and water, Anahita, would be revered by both Iranians and Greeks alike, holding sanctuaries in Pontus, and considered a patron deity by the Greek Diodotic kings of Bactria. Mithra's star would grace the coinage of Pontic and Armenian kings, and the cult would become extremely popular throughout the Hellenistic and later Roman periods. Despite evidence for continuity in the ideas and models of Iranian monarchies, the situation was certainly more complicated. These kings were not just comprised of Iranian subjects, and had to contend with them as much as the Greeks and Macedonian rulers did for their respective dominions. The term often used in the literature is either Middle Iranian or Neo-Persian kingship, and it reflects the transformation of ruling models during the Hellenistic period. Unlike the Greco-Macedonian model, which had its roots with Alexander the Great and the patronage of cosmopolitan Greek culture as part of its presentation, Middle Iranian kingship was a, quote, 
a fractured, alternative, political-cultural counter-narrative, unable to have a concept of shared quote-unquote Persianism like the Greek koine. On the other hand, the kings of Armenia and Pontus were just as capable of adopting or appropriating elements of other cultures, be they Iranian, Macedonian, or Anatolian, in order to strengthen and legitimize their power, much like how the Seleucids and Ptolemies adopted Iranian, Near Eastern, and Egyptian elements in their realms. These rulers were willing to depict themselves with the Hellenistic-style diadem in Alexandrian fashion, as seen on the beautiful coinage of Mithridates VI, or bearing the Persian Kedaris, a headdress that is most famously represented on the reliefs of Antiochus of Comagene or the coins of Tigranes II of Armenia. The coinage of Queen Amostris is very unique, never mind the fact that they were minted on the orders of a royal lady, but they are some of the first and best preserved examples of blended Iranian iconography during the Hellenistic period. On the front is a youth dressed up in the Iranian headgear known as the Phrygian hat, alongside a bow and quiver a symbol of power and authority among Persian and Iranian peoples. The reverse is a seated goddess that blends the imagery of Aphrodite and Anahita together, and displays the Greek script Basilises Amastrios. Even at the earliest stages we can see this development taking into effect, and they are very similar in appearance to the famous coins of contemporary Lysimachus depicting Alexander the Great. Many of the Iranian rulers would actively patronize Greek culture, and openly describe themselves as Philhellene, Mithridates proudly possessed clothing of Alexander the Great and made sacrifices in his honor. Such practices would make their capability to link up with the network of Greco-Macedonian elites much easier, an important element if they wanted to have a more secure hold on their kingdoms. The Mithridates managed to find themselves a valuable political ally in the Seleucid dynasty during the reign of Mithridates II, for he was able to marry Laodike, a daughter of Antiochus II and sister to the then ruling king Seleucus II. The Ariarathids too were able to receive the hand of a Seleucid princess, Stratonike, the sister of Laodike. These marriage alliances were certainly for the benefit of the Seleucids, but it also added a sense of legitimacy to the Pontic and Cappadocian kingdoms, no longer being able to be just seen as lone warlords or rebels, and reflected their growing importance. Though these new kingdoms were quite successful in their own right, the extent of their political importance and influence was quite limited in comparison to the Ptolemies, Seleucids, and Antigonid dynasties, and of these, only Pontus in the reign of Mithridates II could be seen as a formidable mover and shaker of the political landscape. Later Iranian kingdoms would emerge in a similar fashion, such as the Frataraka in the later 3rd century or Komagene in the middle 2nd century, though they too would be little more than regional powers. Unbeknownst to the wider Hellenistic world of the early 3rd century, the greatest of these Iranian dynasties would not be from a noble family from Persia, but instead a small horse-rearing tribe dwelling around the shores of the Caspian Sea. They were known as the Parni, but in only a short time they would migrate into the heart of Seleucid territory, eventually establishing a superpower of the ancient world, the Arsakid Parthian Empire. On that note, let us end the episode with some relevant show updates. Given the enthusiastic response of me uploading my show transcripts, I will continue to do so, but I have converted it to PDF so those of you who are accessing it on mobile can see the footnotes that mark the appropriate reference. You can find the transcript in the episode notes on my website, where I have included several images to help illustrate the points I discussed this episode, so I encourage you to check it out along with my episode bibliography. In a few weeks, I will also be releasing episode 49 and episode 50 at roughly the same time, but while episode 49 will be following my usual format, 50 is a celebratory episode where I am answering questions fielded by you listeners on a wide range of topics. There is still time to send them in, and you could do so by social media or emailing me at hellenisticagepodcast at gmail.com. Besides that, if you like what you listen to, consider subscribing and leaving a review and follow me on any of my social media accounts, which will be included in the podcast description, or by just searching Hellenistic Age Podcast. Next time we meet, we will be revisiting some old friends and discovering new ones in The Barbarians of the Black Sea. So, until then, you've been listening to The Hellenistic Age Podcast. 